Okay. Uh, might as well start if it's all right with you. I, I want to show you my t-shirt. It was, it's got Montaigne on it, and he's saying, what do I know, que je je, in, it's written in early modern French, and it was made by Gay Brahms' father uh, for an alumni, not virtual, an actual alumni seminar, I thought, a few years ago. Um, if anybody was at that seminar, or uh, has studied Montaigne with me, or has studied Montaigne anywhere else, Warning, there's probably not going to be a whole lot new here. This is designed for people who don't know Montaigne, and it's a kind of commercial uh, to get to encourage you to read Montaigne. Um, so with that, thank you to, I was going to say the virtual alumni office, but no, it's a real alumni office for real alumni, and it's a virtual event. And so thank you very much for inviting me. I'm honored and happy to be asked. And here we go. The, talk, the title of the talk is Montaigne and Us. As Bob Dylan sang, the times they are a changing. Back then he seemed happy about it. I'm not sure how happy we should be about what we're seeing. The old American regime the liberal democratic one seems to be in real trouble. Both right and left are impatient with due process, the long run and the preservation of a regime they seem neither to understand nor respect. The left blames Donald Trump, racist white supremacism, Christian fundamentalists, the Proud Boys and mega corporations like Amazon and Facebook while the right blames Antifa, the neo-Marxist and cancel culturing woke, lockdown socialism, and mega corporations like Amazon and Facebook. It used to be said that by conservatives, that conservatives thought liberals were wrong, but liberals thought that conservatives were evil. Right now, I'd say that those who pass dubiously for partisan liberals and conservatives genuinely hate each other. I lived through the nervous breakdown of the Vietnam era. On judicious appraisal, this seems more than a little worse. Back then, I was a historian, drawn to the study of another very troubled time, the beginnings of the Reformation in Germany. But it wasn't really the Catholic or Protestant partisans or theologians who interested me most, but the humanists. The scholars who had hoped to bring something of the warm light of the Italian Renaissance to the grimmer and colder north. They were mostly caught by surprise by the resurgence of what looked to them like outdated and even superstitious religious manias coming back from the ash heap of history like Dracula or Freddy Krueger. I knew that I was looking for someone to model myself on in another time that seemed to be going crazy. Someone who retained balance in the partisan Malay, knowing that the surrounding forces were too great to have much effect on. I wrote my dissertation on one of them, a German called Mutzianus Rufus, Conrad Moot in real life, who had studied with the Italian Neoplatonists and come back to a minor position in a cathedral in central Germany a position he did not take too seriously. Instead, his life was centered on his home. He called it Beata Tranquilitas, Blessed Tranquility, where his learned young friends could come to chat, mock, and philosophize. He is best known as the inspiration, though not the author, of a collection of satirical, anti-clerical letters, the letters of obscure men. You might still be able to get it in English translation in paperback. The kind of thing that was still permissible a couple of years before the balloon went up with Luther in 1517. I felt I got to know his cranky, funny, wise, and of course, Jew-hating personality, almost as well or maybe even better than his best friend, a monk to whom he wrote most of his letters, most of the letters I translated and commented on, which are all we have left of his writings. He, thinking Luther merely a foolish dupe, 
of, get this, the German cities and the Jews, left a book behind and entrusted it to Philip Melanchthon, Luther's chief aide and a great scholar, who burned it, allegedly for lack of erudition in Greek, allegedly. At the time, I knew there were bigger fish in the pond of Northern humanism. One was Erasmus of Rotterdam, whom I studied and both admired and pitied. How plaintive is his conclusion to his defense of the free will against Luther, essentially asking, why can't we all just get along? And how pitiless is Luther's response that it would be better for the world to be burned to a cinder rather than to allow people to go to hell eternally for having the wrong opinion about the freedom of the human will. And then there was Michel de Montaigne, a French nobleman who lived later in the century when things had gotten worse, if anything, with Catholics and Protestants fighting each other all over the country, and at times Catholics even fighting Catholics. You needed, to, you needed that to be able to have a war of the three Henrys. Two Henrys had to be Catholic. He was the inventor of the term and the form essay, and his great work was a collection of these tries, attempts, essays. They were all, he said, a little preface, prefatory note, about himself. A self-portrait was just for his nearest and dearest. He published three editions, adding as he went. That self-portrait, however, led him to talk about God and the world, about history, travel, food, sex, religion, and all was about human thinking and doing and all its strange and often perverse complexity. The form, the essay, was taken up by other great authors, notably Francis Bacon and all those who followed him, down to the middle school English teachers who have distilled it into that grimly rigid five paragraph format of thesis statement explanation and thesis restatement. As for what Montaigne really thought, it wasn't easy to figure out, either by reading him or by reading the intellectual historians who wrote about it. They knew he was very influential, but they couldn't agree on what it was he was actually influencing people with. Shakespeare read him in translation, and there's the famous speech about the ideal kingdom in the Tempest that Gonzalo, the good courtier of a bad king, utters. That's obviously taken from one of Montaigne's most famous essays, literally, word for word part of it, of cannibals. And then there's the Duke's pseudo-stoical speech in Measure for Measure pretending to prep Claudio for death, but in fact designed to terrify him so that he will, through his fear, put his pious sister into a bind from which only the Duke's slimy but benign plan will extricate her. I smell Montaigne all over that speech with its subtle mockery of stoic courage. The great mathematician, theologian, and philosopher Blaise Pascal knew what Montaigne was, he thought, and delivered a powerful blast against his covert atheism and worldliness. 20th century scholars tended to think that Pascal overdid it, that Montaigne, though maybe not really orthodox, was a good enough Christian in his way. After all, as Lucien Febvre had proved to my intellectual history teachers, there were no atheists in the foxholes of the 16th century. Over the centuries, though, a love of Montaigne became the hallmark of a certain kind of person, skeptical, worldly, rather quiet, a gentleman who sipped sherry in his library while appreciating the erudite and nutty just jests of another such as himself. Jane Austen's Mr. Bennett, Herman Melville's Captain Veer are my go-to examples of the stereotypical Montaigne buff. Montaigne is in fact undergoing something of a revival in America today. Just a few years ago, a popular and popularizing book, and a good one of its kind, was published by Sarah Bakewell. It's called How to Live. I recommend it. I read Montaigne back then and bounced off him. It wasn't that the essays aren't a great read. They are. They're learned, amusing, full of fascinating speculations, jokes, patent nonsense masquerading as sober erudition some very tight arguments about epistemology, some very loose ones about morality, lots of fireworks going off all over the place. 
but I couldn't find the red thread, the key to what was surely going on beneath the stories, the bromides and the endless self-contradictions. The essay, the try, enabled Montaigne to roam all over the place, sometimes abandoning the putative topic altogether. He exemplifies a distinction that Michel Foucault, a pretty good intellectual historian before he became a postmodern cultural icon, made between the clear, abstract, ordered, categorical, God's eye view thinkers of the 17th century like Descartes and Spinoza and the wild, messy, disorderly, hells a poppin' great writers of the 16th, like him, like Montaigne, maybe Rabelais. Despite my confusion, I knew that it would be important for me to figure him out. I knew he knew something that mattered to me, precisely along the lines of how to stay sane in a crazy world, but he wasn't telling me clearly enough. Later, I ended up at Kenyon, somewhat fraudulently giving myself out as a political scientist and worse, a student of political thought. And I came back to Montaigne more than once, again, without success. I began to read contemporary Montaigne scholars of a different bent than my, than any, than my Lucien Febvre obedient history professors. But whether it was my friend David Schaefer or Anne Hartle, who was to become an admired acquaintance, or the great Swiss critic Jean Starobinsky, or more recently, the eminent contemporary French philosopher Pierre Manet, I found that each one of them had found their own Montaigne in the essays, but one which differed considerably from that of the others. Montaigne seemed to be something like the mirror of Erised. You saw in him what you wanted to see, the answer to the question you brought to him. Was he the French Hobbes? And his epistemological skepticism just a sham? Was he a good Catholic, sincerely moved by being made an honorary citizen of Rome? Was he the creator of the modern self that replaced the Christian soul? Or was he then ultimately an esthete who skeptically rejected the world of appearances, but then returned to those appearances himself with some kind of resignation or joy or both? As far as I, and I'm not a scholar in these things or in anything really, could tell, any and all of these could be right. Indeed, they all were right in the sense that the evidence for them was there and they marshaled it well. But like the punchline of the joke about the rabbi who tells both complainant and defendant that they are in the right, and when his wife objects that they can't both be in the right, tells her that she too is in the right, if they were all right, they couldn't all be simply right. It was so tempting and yet so unreliable a thing to find a basic proof text in Montaigne and then to build on that. But if you couldn't find such proof texts, then how could you bring any kind of order to the sea of reminiscence, speculation, self-revelation, how honest one always has to ask, and philosophizing of which the essays consist? In any case, what I wanted, had wanted from my time as a college student on, the question I was asking, none of their Montaigne's answered, at least to my satisfaction. Around the turn of this century, my gallbladder happened to go bad. That's a very Montanian thing to tell you, by the way. He is very confessional about his kidney stones. A couple of weeks before I was planning to go to a Liberty Fund conference, on Montaigne that David Schaefer had kindly invited me to. I had a couple of weeks of bed rest after the operation and it was opportune to read my Montaigne assignment. By some strange chance, this time from the very first essay of book one, a throwaway according to some scholars who think he's just warming up, I found my red thread. And as I pursued it, I began to make out my own image in the mirror of said my question, my Montaigne. Perhaps it was just me dressed in 16th century clothing. I do not claim to know who Montaigne is as such, but I can tell you about my Montaigne based on proof texts that I think are crucial. And I feel less ashamed about shamelessly admitting that this is just my not very learned take because I read a wonderful piece of scholarship about that first essay 
by Professor Robert Eden of Hillsdale College. He went to the trouble of looking up every quotation and historical reference that Montaigne makes. And there are plenty of them just in that short essay. What he found was that Montaigne distorted, misquoted, and otherwise played games with just about every single source. After reading that, I came to his view that nobody can even begin to say anything definitive about Montaigne until some poor learned scholar is willing to spend, if not a lifetime, then a good chunk of it, looking up every reference and quotation in all a thousand plus pages or so of the essays and seeing what mischief Montaigne had done with it. Until then, I thought, I get to play too. As I read that first essay, probably for the third time in my life, I noticed that the apparently pointless account of how sometimes standing up to your conqueror pays off in mercy, and sometimes it doesn't, focused on the character of Alexander the Great. Montaigne praises him to the skies, but ends up by showing his vindictive cruelty to a brave opponent called Betis, a cruelty that closely resembles and was probably meant to imitate what Achilles did to Hector's body. I realized that cruelty was going to be an important issue, above all its source in the human soul. I saw too that Montaigne was using Alexander's cruelty as an example of the deformation and displacement of the self. So a couple of essays farther in, I found my personal Montaignean proof text. In the third essay, Our Feelings Reach Out Beyond Us, he says, that we are never at home, we are always beyond. Fear, desire, hope, project us towards the future and steal from us the feeling and consideration of what is. Unlike animals that are always present in the moment, human beings need therapists and gurus to teach us how. We are always, Montaigne reminds us, somewhere else, somewhere in the future or the past, thinking about what to do, what it all means, what they think of us, but almost never at home in ourselves experiencing what it is we are experiencing. He tells us that we are not who we are and do not believe what we believe because self-consciousness and imagination divide us from ourselves. Yet Montaigne is no romantic proto-Rousseauian dreaming of getting back to a simple unitary consciousness. In fact, Rousseau didn't think we could do that either. Instead, Montaigne accepts our going out, our perpetual self-alienation, but then through a kind of judo, turns it against itself, brings it back home to the self. Thus, much later in book three, in Of Repentance, Montaigne says that while he is never at home, he is always very near it. That's as good as it gets, he seems to say. But how to do that? How to keep one's balance when the world around you is going even crazier than it normally seems? That was my question to Montaigne as to all the 16th century humanists. And not surprisingly, my Montaigne devotes his magnum opus to answering it. In short, it involves a going out from oneself that is never so utterly overmastering that it prevents you from going out from that going out and thus finding a way back to the divided, an unsatisfactory, but at least not insane situation that goes with being human. Where Leo Strauss says that humanism as an alternative to the choice between reason and revelation is impossible because man is always the being who ascends above and falls beneath himself. And tertium non datur, a third is not given. Montaigne might say, I think in reply, that Strauss is right if you're talking about a still photograph but not if it's a moving picture. We do ascend and descend, but our situation from which we always go out remains the same and is the base to which we must always return. As such, a reflection that makes that fundamental human situation central to itself might be worthwhile. Alexander's horrible cruelty is by contrast, <laughs> one of the things that happen when you pursue an ideal without regard to what it is doing to you, to the self-alienation it causes. <clears throat> Alexander is cruel because he is pursuing an ideal, godlike Alexander. 
This means making the mistake of seeing himself as he wants others to see him and losing touch with his own humanity, his own vulnerability. Alexander notoriously wanted to be a god. <clears throat> and Bettis, who challenged that with his own courage, had to be destroyed. A good contemporary take on this kind of cruelty is treated in Kenyan alumna Abigail R. Esman's book, Rage, which connects domestic violence and terrorism under the rubric of pathological narcissism. Montaigne, who says of Alexander that, quote, there is nothing so humble and mortal in the life of Alexander as his fantasies about immortalization, shows you what one needs to avoid. What follows in book one is, as far as I can see, a seemingly random, but actually rather careful, exploration of the ways in which we get lost, go beyond ourselves, and fail to come back. These include imagination, custom, and of course, religion. But it is the knowledge of our mortality that dominates, because we can neither accept nor reject its inevitability. And above all, fear of death is what divides us from ourselves. The stoic pose of rational overcoming of that dilemma comes in for a lot of superficial praise and actual mockery. Cato, the heroic Roman who killed himself rather than live under Caesar's empire, is praised to the skies and then unobtrusive shovelful by shovelful, gradually undermined and shown to be kind of a kind of poser. The Jews, and Montaigne's mother <clears throat> came from a family of Spanish Jewish converts to Catholicism. The Jews appear periodically as examples of a kind of pathetic fanaticism of self loss in devotion to their faith. Hence the Jewish women who drown their babies rather than give them up to the Christians. This theme, like the closely related one of cruelty returns at the beginning of book two where we get the grotesque near comedy of that good old quote, good old again, Jewish man, Razi, who kept trying to kill himself and keeps not quite getting there. There too, we find the one of the man being burned at the stake and driven so mad with pain that he starts joking, this side's done, turn me to the other. This is the transcendent heroism of overcoming the body's horrible agony by a total separation from it heroism and madness at once. At the end of Of Moderation, the essay that precedes the famous Of Cannibals, where without hiding the cruelty of Brazilian natives, Montaigne shows his European readers that they don't have much grounds for looking down on the cannibals, there is a remarkable passage. Some tribes Cortez defeated in Mexico come to him with gifts saying, look, here are five slaves. If you are a cruel God that feeds on flesh and blood, eat them and we will bring you more. If you are a good natured God, here are incense and plumes. If you are a man, take these birds and fruits. That's the job Montaigne sets for himself. How to be a human being, not a devil or an angel. The way to do that seems to be dialectical. That is, one must explore the extremes, both in thought and feeling, in order to come back to the middle. An example is the essay on drunkenness, where at one point he describes himself as imitating the Germans who just slug it all down without any concern for taste. But that too was just a step in coming back to the middle. In that essay, he does an amazing thing. It's a Jew display, it's a joke. He gets drunk. You can see him getting drunk as the essay goes on. He starts by condemning drunkenness. He gets more relaxed about it. Then he gets into the uh, slug it down like the Germans don't care about taste. Then like a drunk, he starts talking about sex and about his father's sexual conquests and his father's athletic abilities. And then he remembers he's supposed to be talking about drunkenness. And he says drunkenly, well, let's get back to our bottles. And then he sobers up and moves back to moderation. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a lovely little essay and it's a wonderful demonstration of the technique, yeah? Of which he follows in many other cases. There is indeed one essay where Montaigne seems to go over the top himself, the famous essay of friendship, where he grieves in the most extreme terms for his deceased friend, Etienne de la Boite, saying that since his death, he has never been happy. 
But the overall impression that I get is of a rhetorical exercise more than genuine grief. The essay says very little about Boiti specifically, and Montaigne reneges on his plan to follow up with an essay by Boiti. Even Montaigne's closest friend is present mostly in his absence. True, Montaigne's self-involvement and self-possession may indeed be a weakness in that they lead him to treat everyone with, to some degree, ironically. People I respect greatly have spoken of his coldness, a self-possession that doesn't really seem to reach out, that treats everyone fairly, but ironically. Of course, that might put him in the same class as Socrates. It may come with a territory of keeping a, convenient, a constant watch on oneself. Book two continues the themes of the first. It continues to sketch out a project similar to, but different from Plato's Socrates. Instead of ascending to pure rationality and viewing the world ironically from above, Montaigne despairs of ridding himself of his passions and follies, but by keeping a tight rein on them while knowingly indulging them to a degree, he prevents himself from going as nuts as those around him. Book two is, however, strangely interrupted by an essay that is really a book in itself and is of a character markedly different from what comes before and after. Notably, however, the essay that precedes this strange apology for Raymond Sebon is called Of Cruelty. And there we find the famous line, I cruelly hate cruelty. That might just be a slightly clever way of saying how much he hates cruelty, but I take it to be self-reflexive, recognizing in himself the very danger of being carried away and deformed by righteous indignation or pride that he sees in the cruel. And indeed in book three, he will confess to suffering from a tendency to schadenfreude himself. It is there that he finally settles with his supposed hero, Cato the Younger in book two, whose noble suicide is now seen as masochistic hedonism. Still, the middle of the essays is given, given over to Sebon, a long, obscure, winding, self-contradictory, and often tongue-in-cheek discussion of epistemology, of what humans can know. It doesn't seem to fit the rest of the book, and Montaigne may even have thought hard about whether to include it. But as the center of the second book, it seems, however strange, by Montaigne's own announced rules, since he says of ancient painters that they always put the most important thing in the middle to be of the greatest importance. On the one hand, it tells tall tales, mostly from Plutarch, about things like how tuna fish are splendid geometricians. And on the other, he denies that humans can know anything. The upshot, if there is one, seems to be that humans don't know the truth, but can't even know they couldn't possibly find it. A kind of zetetic skepticism that has a lot in common with Socrates, double knowledge that he knows nothing and that he knows the best life is searching for knowledge. The moral implication of this and perhaps why it is introduced by of cruelty is clear enough though. Neither the fanaticism of the dogmatic nor the later Nietzschean fanaticism of the irrationalists, religious or secular, as in nothing is true, so shut up and do it my way, are legitimate ways of living. I mean, the religious are not the, the, the Nietzschean types, um, but the secular ones would be. Knowing the limits of one's knowing is a necessary condition for accepting the limits of one's person and the limits of one's choices. There is nothing quite so far from the existential commitments that justify post-Nietzschean thinkers like Sartre and their self-expressive followers as Montaigne's controlled skepticism. It is those idealists and self-lovers who are most likely to deform themselves and make life a hell for those around them. Montaigne's skepticism is, I think, meant as a reminder, a kind of epistemological memento mori, if you like, to keep us in ourselves as much as possible. The third and final book gives you the great set pieces like of experience where he shows you the finished picture of what the first two books lead up to. At the very end of this concluding essay, he warns, between ourselves, there are two things that I have always observed to be in singular accord, super celestial thoughts and subterranean conduct. He says of the spiritually ambitious, 
They want to get out of themselves and escape from the man. That is madness. Instead of changing into angels, they change into beasts. These transcendental humors frighten me. Absolute perfection, he says, is to know how to enjoy our own being rightfully. There is no use walking on stilts because you're still using your own legs. And on the loftiest throne in the world, we're still sitting only on our own rump. The most beautiful life, lives, he concludes, are those that conform to the common human pattern with order, but without miracle, and without eccentricity. In the same way, and apparently he was the first to do so, he separates Socrates from Plato. He is, one can say, a non-Platonic Socrates, if that makes sense. Shearing the Platonic Socrates of his woolly coat of metaphysics, of his ecstasies and possessions by the daemon, and leaving the ironic inquirer into humble things and people. But unlike the Socratic philosopher who transcends the passions with pure reason, Montaigne offers a strange balance of oscillating imbalance, an unstable stability, a going out from oneself that should be accepted as inevitable and not fought, but that allows a coming back to the original self-contradictions that sent us out in the first place but which thereby learn to live relatively comfortably with each other. That's the Montaigne that Montaigne wants the world to recall, the solitary in his library, above and away from the ugly world of his times of civil war and passionate folly. But that is by no means the full or even all that accurate a picture of the real Montaigne. He was in fact politically ambitious, going to Paris to seek a career at the court and failing. Back home, he served apparently very effectively as mayor of Bordeaux in a time and place that was at the heart of the religious civil war. Also, it is believed that on one occasion, he gave advice that ultimately led to the end of the civil wars and reestablished and the reestablishment of a competent central government. That was after the Battle of Coutras, when the Protestant Henry of Navarre, though outnumbered, defeated the army of King Henry III. The story is that he spent the night at Montaigne's where his host advised him not to follow up his victory militarily, but to take the opportunity to come to terms with the king and ally with him against the third Henry, the Duke of Guise, the head of the fanatical Catholic League. Navarre took his advice and ultimately became the next king of France, Henry IV. Nor was Montaigne all that safe in his library. He tells of an attempted assault by a neighbor who brings his armed posse with him and who was foiled by Montaigne's cheerful politeness as he invites him in and offers him refreshments so that he is too embarrassed to admit he's really there to sack and pillage. An amazing story and very Montanian. Montaigne also writes a good bit about politics. Notably, he rejects Machiavellianism on grounds that are perhaps more Machiavellian than Machiavelli's own. Thus Machiavelli preaches doing one's cruel deeds at the beginning so one doesn't have to keep doing them later. Montaigne views this as naive idealism. You always have to keep doing them, so don't put your hopes in exemplary cruelty at the start. But he is remarkably un-Machiavellian when he says that he would understand a prince who could not bring himself to do an immoral deed that was politically advisable. This makes no sense, unless at some level politics, however important, is secondary to the state of one's mental health. Here Montaigne is with Jesus, but also with Socrates. And so he says that we, he will happily go with the right side, even up to the fire, but not into it, if he can help it. So much for Montaigne. But what about the us part of this talk? While we aren't quite at the level of the War of the Three Henrys, each of whom eventually died by assassination. It is plain enough that a kind of madness is tearing our society apart. January 6th and its aftermath, culminating recently in the expulsion of Liz Cheney from the leadership of the Republican Party, Republican minority in Congress, showed, shockingly, I think, how a narcissistic demagogue has taken over the intense and personal loyalty of what was once a notoriously drab and stodgy part of the political spectrum. 
And that personal loyalty is extended to the melodramatic and extreme framing of just about all political issues. Meanwhile, the eager embrace by another large part of the political spectrum of woke ideology, complete with a recycled racialism, not to say racism, and a new patriotism whose main content seems to be hatred of the old, is an equally significant symptom. The enthusiasm on both sides for throwing out the old procedural norms that are seen impatiently to get in the way of achieving ends, whether it is Ibram Kendi's dream of compelled equal results for blacks or far-right fantasies of violent action to keep them from replacing us should alarm anyone who hasn't drunk either flavor of Kool-Aid. Alarming as well is the utter intellectual dishonesty, at least alarming to me, is the utter intellectual dishonesty of the partisans of both sides who switch substantive positions the moment their immediate partisan interests change. Thus, those who fervently denounced the elections of 2000, 2004, 2004 and 2016 as illegitimate swear by the integrity of the vote in 2020 and vice versa. And just in case you're worried, I'm quite sure that the 2020 election was legitimate, but so too it seems was 2016. Nor is the violence merely verbal. However one weighs them against each other, the outrage of January 6th and the mostly peaceful depredations of American cities the previous summer, not to mention more recent events, suggest strongly that things are coming apart pretty rapidly. We aren't Thucydides Corsaira yet, where fratricide was sanctioned by partisan rage, but to me, we're closer than is comfortable. In such times, times like Montaigne's, individuals go crazy too. Politics trumps friendship, as I have had cause to know. When that happens, people become separated from themselves in precisely the ways Montaigne describes. Dr. Jekyll, that kindly fellow, gives way to Mr. Hyde, and the capacity to reflect on oneself, to qualify one's judgments, disappears. The apparent urgency and gravity of choices make us cling to abstractions or even just symbols, and we fall under the control of simple, emotionally loaded, and intellectually barren ideas. We become machines for the making of the appropriate noises of our class, our crowd, our team, our party. Loyalty not to people, one knows, but to causes, makes us betray not just those we have lived with and known, but ourselves. We become fragmentary, inchoate, like the pathetic figures Montaigne describes in book one, who drown their children, try desperately to kill themselves, or joke as they're burnt alive, that's book two. At the same time, the feeling of self-loss actually is intoxicating, since it gives the illusion of transcending one's ordinary, awkward, inadequate existence and becoming part of a glorious collective of warriors for justice, social or otherwise. And like every intoxicant, it needs stronger doses, angrier feelings, greater battles and triumphs to keep its grip on you, to keep you from the sickening fall from the glories of what Sartre called fraternity terror, and he wasn't talking about the Deeks, where we find authenticity in the constant mutual risk of our lives, back into what he contemptuously called serial alterity, meaning the hell of daily life, of tamely taking your place in the bus queue. This is where, in the 1960s version of ideological tumult, a phenomenon much less serious in retrospect than what we're going through now and, re and repelled as I was by the depraved taste of the Sartrean charlatans, I started looking for answers from the 16th century humanists. This is where Montaigne comes in now. I think he is the best guide I know to help keep one sane in times like ours. He knows that we will inevitably go out into metaphysics, ideologies, causes, but he teaches us how not to lose ourselves out there, teaches us how to come back, how to qualify and moderate our own passions and how to have some fellow feeling, even for those toxic fools we disagree with, as we have some fellow feeling for ourselves and our own colleagues. I recommend reading him. 
Whether or not you figure out to your satisfaction what he is up to, he is a very fun read, full of weird and amusing stories, like one about how he cured his friend's ED. And of pithy observations. Whether Mr. Bennett understood all that much of him, he certainly absorbed the tone and the feel, and even that is tonic for us today, I think. To read him is ultimately to make a friend, maybe just an imaginary one, but they too can be of great value. And he will be a friend who will counsel you well, calm you and make you laugh at others and at yourself. When you are most righteously indignant, most filled with super celestial thoughts and most inclined to subterranean conduct. And if, as I hope is true of all of you, you are not inclined to join the mobs today, even in spirit, but are genuinely shocked and bemused by what is going on, then Montaigne is an excellent teacher about the ways that human beings get lost, get separated from themselves, so that you can learn how to understand our, our times and live in them. And best of all, it's a big, long book, but you can read it in very small pieces and enjoy it for all the different things you find each time you read him. So that's it. And I will be happy to take questions if there are any. And I'm not sure quite how this works technically, but whoever has a question, please ask. So far, it hasn't worked. Somebody? Bueller? I don't know how I'm, how I'm going to find who, who it is. So just start talking, please, somebody. Are there any uh, positive changes um, that have come about from the current movement that are ah. too positive? Uh, you know, say it's the you death of George Floyd. Well, which mm -hmm. current Since the death of George Floyd, are there any positive changes to policing in your mind or any other uh, uh, areas? I, of... I could tell you an increased consciousness of the difficulties and, da -da, and yeah, and all that. But I'm, I'm inclined, given my general view of the matter, to tell you an anecdote about Senator Eugene McCarthy, who was running against Lyndon Johnson in 1968 for the primary. And he was asked, don't you have anything good to say about the Johnson administration? And he said, have you ever heard a positive review of an accordion concert? So yeah, no doubt uh, there are some good things you can find if you've got a nose for them. Uh, I would say on the whole, um, I, I look at all of this as a nervous breakdown on all sides. Uh, and I think it's hard not to see that. I mean, I'll tell you, frankly, I thought that the problem was worse on the left than on the right, but January 6th set me straight. Uh, it's the madness is at least as great there. Someone else. Fred, uh, at some point, and this is less about Montaigne than about uh, your view of current politics, and I want to get back to Montaigne, but um, you said that you felt that the, the current situation is actually the current developments politically are, are worse today than in the 60s. Uh, I think so, absolutely. So, so say more, because when I think of the 60s, I think of the weathermen, I think of, uh, you know, yeah. Syria. The 60s was partly it was mostly campus and young people and uh it stopped on a dime after kent state uh and it was about something that was soluble which is the vietnam war as soon as we said we're getting out okay uh the issues here are much greater uh the numbers of i mean you, you also you've got social media now which inflames and intensifies and, and drives everyone crazy yeah, um, I think it's 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 gone much deeper. Uh, reasonable people are on all sides, uh, no longer reasonable. As I say, I think that there's real hatred now. 
and it's constantly being blown up by the institutions. The institutions are much less effective now than they were. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have uh, vehement complaints about our, our criminal justice system, and that leads people to want to get rid of the police altogether. And the, the thing is that their complaints about the criminal justice system are really, really valid. It's god awful what happens in America's prisons and, and to people who are arrested. Uh, I was just reading of a professor at a Harvard sociologist who's done her work on you know, what, what actually happens to poor people and minorities in prisons. And you can't defend it. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, um, I think we're much less trustful of our institutions uh, than we were. Uh, I don't think something like uh, the 1619 critique would have had anything like the credibility that it's gotten. I don't think you'd have had schools teaching it as, as gospel and dogma um, to, to kindergartners. Uh, there's a kind of self-loathing in the air that I don't think uh, the 60s was anything like. There was a little of it, but some of it, but this is, this seems to me go much deeper. Thanks. Uh, I saw- we have, a, we have a question from the chat. Uh, if there are any Montaigne texts that you suggest reading. Well, I mean, what you basically have is the essays and then you've got uh, a travel journey. So the question really is, what do you want to read in the essays? And you can read great hits. And the great hits are of cannibals, of friendship, of repentance, uh, on some verses of Virgil, uh, of experience. I tend to think that that isn't the best way to read them. It's better just to start at the beginning and go at your own pace and stop if you want to and pick it up later. Um, because that way, you begin to get a feel for him. Uh, the great set pieces are meant to be great set pieces. And, and he's a very deceptive writer. And if you try to really go deep into them without seeing what's come before, uh, I think you're likely to miss stuff. At least that was my experience. Um, and I, I wouldn't go into him, you know, with a laser-like attention. Uh, I go into him here and there, see what you can get. The, the ones I mentioned are, are the big set pieces, or some of them, um, and they're wonderful. And if, if that's what you, you, you can do, um, you know, go for them, that, that, that's fine. Uh, ideally though, I think just take it slow and uh, absorb it as you go and see what you make of it. Is there a translation you recommend? Yes, thank you for asking. Um, there's a, uh, it's this one, and it's Donald M. Frame, F-R-A-M-E. And I'm told by people who know French a lot better than I do that it's very good, but here and there, they think he makes a mistake about this or that. But I think everybody agrees that's the translation. And you can get it in two, in two forms. You can get the essays or you can get the complete works, um, which basically is the travel journal attached to it. Um, so. Have, um, when yep. you talked about um, Montaigne being sort of seen as aloof and you know Mr. Bennett is also talked of as sort of aloof and not quite um and as engaged as he could be um where where is this but then also Montaigne possibly ended the large civil war so where's the sweet spot between speaking up and effecting change and not being in this nervous breakdown well, that's appreciated. And like, where's where's the moderating force and to be part of that dialogue and not just stepping back into a hole? I think that's very fair. And I think that's 
something that everybody works out for themselves. I like Montaigne's line, I will follow the right side to the fire, but not into it if I can help it. Um, it's not an issue of not getting involved, but it's checking yourself constantly as you are and standing to some extent outside your party, your group, what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, in, in Montaigne's day, there were <laughs> the three factions, the Protestants and the two Catholic factions, the Royalist Catholics and the Catholic League. But there was yet a fourth faction and they were called the politique. And I think Montaigne really is one of the politique. And their position, as the name politique suggests, was um, we don't care about the religion of our king. We want a political solution. We'll take anybody as long as we can get along and agree. And Montaigne was, I think, an active, I, th I think he is a, a politique. Um, so, um, You can, I think, join one of the factions. You can be part of it, but it's a question of how. And are you the kind of person who looks to make peace with the enemy or are you look to, always looking to own the enemy? Are you looking for livable compromises or are you looking for total victory and total extinction? Those are the kind of questions I think that, that, that uh, he might ask you about how you were doing it. Yeah. Uh, as I say, the image he gives you of himself alone up in the, that isn't quite exactly who he was. Yeah. I mean, while he's doing this, he's also mayor of Bordeaux, you know, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, the regional. Yeah. Um, so it's a matter of attitude and tone rather than where you draw the line. Yeah. The sweet spot is in you, not out there. Yeah. Okay. I, I saw somebody said that uh, Gutenberg, you can get it online with Gutenberg. Yes, you can, but uh, I don't much think you'll enjoy the translation. Um, yeah, I would bet not. Not It's not going to be Donald Frame, probably. No. Look on Amazon, maybe the frame. Oh, you can frame on Amazon. Easy. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's the, standard, it's the standard translation. Thank you so much for this. This is really inspiring. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. Is, is this it? We done? Well, I hope not. <laughs> that, that, I that's just a valedictory uh, tone to it. But thank I have a question you very much for saying that. that. I've enjoyed it a lot. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I think one of the most interesting parts of the of the book is in the essay of giving the lie, uh, where he sort of speaks about this, uh, this question that he has about the value of his writing if no one reads it. And he talks about having used more color to paint himself in the writing than perhaps was there originally. Um, and talks about how some of the most delightful pleasures come from those that are digested inwardly. So I guess the question uh, with respect to those, those statements is, do you think Montaigne saw more value in the project of the essay in terms of what he could impart about himself to others or what he could impart about himself, I guess, to himself? That's a very good question. And I surely don't know. I think only Montaigne could know. Uh, he produces a prepared version of himself that is clearly not simply himself. Now, what the relation between that fictive Montaigne, who's partly fictive, and the real one is, is very hard to know because there's an awful lot of design in it. He will tell you quite openly, I say what I mean, but not as much as I would like to. I dare, I go as far as I could go, as I dare go. If I contradict myself, it's because I'm in a different mood at different times. Uh, he lets you know, always keep your hand on your wallet when you're reading me. He is very much, I mean, when he reads Plato and Aristotle, he reads them like Leo Strauss a lot. He reads them as skeptics 
who speak between the lines and don't mean what they say a lot of the time. And of course, that's who he is too. Um, so who he really is, I don't think we're ever gonna know. Um, but who, he'll, he's like a football you know, halfback who gives you a leg and takes it away and you tackle the leg and it's not there anymore. Um, he lies like crazy. He says, everything is pure honesty. I have no dress, right? this is, I, if I could go naked, I would. Uh, and this is only for my close family and friends. And then he publishes three editions of it. Um, and the lies are, are pretty patent and you, they're there for you to think about, uh, yeah? Um, his medical confessions, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not so sure that uh, uh, his account of his kidney disease is, is accurate. I, I, I talked to a medical specialist once about it. He said, well, it might be. Um, but uh, he, he's very confessional and he's also very elusive. And what he got out of it himself, how much self-knowledge he got out of it, I think is a very good question. I would imagine a great deal. Um, but the self he portrays is meant, I think, um, to be useful to other people, to see themselves. Um, Hobbes comes, you know, a couple generations later, and he'll lay it all out in the most external form, the most mechanical form. It's all matter in motion. I'm going to show it to you. And then he says, Hobbes says at the start of, of at, the, at the very end of his little preface, uh, all that remains for the reader is to see how this applies to him, to do, in other words, what Montaigne does. And it's just a little bit of thing here in Hobbes, yeah. Uh, you do it yourself. Well, that's all that Montaigne does. What's it like to be me? What's it like to be these other people? What's the back and forth between us? What do we learn about ourselves? And that's why it's such a great book, I think, because you learn about yourself, and you learn about others. So, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right, too. So, so Fred, I, I have a question about this as an answer to the problem of death because uh, I'd like it to be. Uh, yeah. is, is, it, is, it a, is it an answer by deflection? I mean, does, because no. a lot of it seems to be a, a, a sort of an exploration of the diff different illusions that we try to con ourselves with and the different masks that we wear. And uh, the upshot seems to be a kind of Socratic wonder. But uh, I, I wondered, it doesn't seem like the fear of death is something you ever conquer, but it also, which means that it seems like it's something we're always running from. That is, is that the well, one? What he says is that the way to overcome as much as possible the fear of death is to embrace it. So think about it all the time so that it doesn't catch you by surprise and you don't start going nuts and planning your funeral and worrying about stuff like that or having people, you know, make a drum out of your skin like, like uh, Ziska. Um, you just think about it a lot, so it's inevitable, it's gonna happen. Yeah, okay, right. And then he says, I would like death to find me hoeing my cabbages, caring not much about my, my death or about the cabbages. Um, you know, whether you can pull that off or not, I don't know, but that, that's, it's not deflecting it. It's embracing it, not in, in some morbid way, but in the kind of matter of fact way. And in some ways, I think that is Socratic, pretty close to Socrates. Uh, in fact, he did not die when he was hoeing his cabbages. He had a rather nasty throat infection and had a rather unpleasant death. And he died a good Catholic. He, he was confessed and, and went through last rites. Uh, whether, uh, whether he was a believer or not, I, I'm inclined to think no. Um, but uh, he certainly maintained uh, appearances and maybe he was. But that's his answer, which is don't deflect it. Um, make it matter of fact, live with it, learn to live with it and think about it a lot. Not in an oogie boogie kind of way, but just, yeah, sure, I'm gonna die. I try to do that and we'll see how it works out. I wonder though if if the sequence isn't you begin to think about your death 
but that does it doesn't stop there. Um, from there, he goes to the different tricks your mind plays on you to deal with that. And from there, it's kind of a phenomenology of, of uh, self-deceit, right? But, that, but it's interesting because it's ourselves and it's human nature. And then it's kind of a, a parade of, of the different things that we do. Um, and uh, but it's still a kind of, you know, it, it, there's no settling of the issue. Well, kind of, I think uh, he would say that if you really always have that perspective, it, it's kind of a weird version of, of the Christian memento mori. Uh, if you always have that thought, look, I'm going to die, then the motive for the deceptions, it's easier to uncover them and to get away from them. Right. Yeah, it's when you yeah. have this sort of, belief that you're immortal, which is very human, you know, moment to moment, yeah, um, that death then creeps up on you and shocks you and, and you do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, so, you know, always think about, look, you know, it's a given fact, nature, you're going to die. Uh, don't, don't get into a tennis about it. You know? It's a release from the illusions, but I wonder if the real payoff is, is you know, wonder, right? Wonder at the human mind. Um, yeah. Um, this goes to what he says about Socrates. You know, he doesn't like the Socrates of the demonic possession, the highfalutin Socrates. And there's almost nothing highfalutin in Montaigne. And maybe, <laughs> maybe there is that in some way. And maybe uh, the previous questioner who said, maybe that comes from Montaigne in writing this book. I think that that might well be right. Um, but you don't, what you see is balance, stability, and that strange kind of stability isn't all that stable. Yeah. Um, that is, that, that, but uh, trying to be at home trying to experience what you're experiencing. He says, you know, if I'm gonna be operated on, I wanna feel the pain. Not because I'm a masochist, but I wanna be where things really are happening. I wanna deal with reality. Um, that is a little different, I think, from philosophic wonder. Um, I, it's a little more like, you know, the, uh, the lie that everyone hates. Everybody wants to know the truth about themselves. I think he's closer to that. Uh, it's after eight, shall, shall I take one more question if there is one and then thank you. Someone thanked me earlier. I wanna thank you for taking the time to, to listen to all this stuff. And I do hope you- I think we have prepared. time for one more question. Yeah, your reward comes in, in uh, in uh, reading Montaigne. Can I ask the last one, I guess? <laughs> uh, if nobody else is gonna jump in. Professor, um, you mentioned uh, to us 10 years ago, just like tonight, you know, Montaigne and Thucydides both provide pretty strong warnings against righteous indignation, which uh, go hand in hand with your discussion on cruelty both seem to provide a solution involving dialectic or philosophy, which, you know, the program at Kenyon was pretty good about reminding us, you know, is not necessarily available to everyone or yeah. most people aren't capable of that. And so do you see any sort of straightforward solution to our current uh, problem that you were talking about other than sending everyone to Kenyon? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Alex, to, to some extent, there is a kind of, not political, but class answer in Montaigne. And it is, it is Mr. Bennett and Captain Devere. You, what he does is he creates a class of gentlemen. Uh, Locke's education is, is not at all that different from the, the appeal to that kind of gentleman. Uh, the kind of gentleman who 
uh, sees enthusiasm as a disease of the liver. That's what they said in the 18th century. Uh, who, uh, or Oscar Wilde's line, a gentleman only loses his temper on purpose. Um, you create, it's a class thing. It's not, you know, it, it, it's an upper class um, and there's this real vanity in it, you know, wanting to show that uh, you're unflappable, um, collected, ironic. Uh, it doesn't fit American democracy at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's the matter with you, you four eyed creep? Um, that's democracy. Um, and righteous indignation goes with democracy. But uh, I'll tell you a story. I was in Manhattan in the early 80s. I was, it was a hot summer day. I was on the train, on the subway. It stopped. And uh, you, you could hear the public address system. <laughs> Nobody could make out what it was saying. Uh, and people started to get antsy. And some people started to try to pry the doors open and walk on the tracks. And I remember some guys behind me. And one of them said, you, you want to go now? And the other guy said, well, let's wait till the suits start doing it. Yeah, the suits. There was that sense that even in, in, in 1980s America, in, in New York, uh, let's see what the, the suits do. Let's see what those people are doing before we decide to panic. Um, and sure enough, the train went off pretty soon. Um, if you have a class of respectable people, the haute bourgeoisie or the gentlemen, uh, they can have an effect. And we've lost that. We've replaced it with a credentialed meritocracy, which has very little of the quality of that old high bourgeoisie, uh, whether it was really all that high, even if it was just provincial. Um, people who read Gibbon, yeah, the banker who read Gibbon is a character in a uh, uh, Sinclair Lewis novel from the 1920s. Um, when you don't have that, when you have technocrats who are constantly trying to show their street cred in some way or another, uh, then it's, it, it doesn't have that effect. But it did. It did for hundreds of years, I think, uh, have a good effect on people. And to the extent that uh, what's left of that educated bourgeoisie went to Kenyan, uh, you guys have the job of being sane and uh, trying to influence others to be sane too. Okay, thank you very much again. And I, it's a privilege and an honor and it's great to have taught you, most of you, some of you. And I wish you well. Take care. Dude, hopefully next year they'll have more of these with or without pandemic, you know, no reason. No <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Good night. Good night.